Welcome to Bellingham Voices. I'm Marie Marchand. My guests on today's episode will be giving you a lot of information about two things in particular, access to healthcare and social security. And the show will be in two segments. My first guest is Australia Cosby. In the next segment, I'll be interviewing Scott McAllister, who's the manager of the local Social Security Administration office. First, Australia Cosby is a local healthcare consumer advocate, and she currently serves as the operations manager for WAHA, Wacom Alliance for Health Advancement. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You bet, thanks for coming. Before we jump into all of the WAHA programs, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your experience as a student at Western Washington University in the Human yeah. Service Program, and then also what you did directly after graduation, because I have a feeling that maybe those things led in the direction where you are now. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Uh, I graduated from Western in 2012 with a Human Services and Rehabilitation slash Spanish background. And I honestly felt really burnt out from school, so I took a six-month trip to Oaxaca, Mexico, where my family is from. So spent my time there and um, volunteered at our local hospital, kind of becoming like a patient liaison with working with indigenous communities there and help, helping them access health care. Um, I found that uh, it was a really rewarding experience. Uh, our indigenous communities there in, in Mexico don't speak Spanish. They, they have different cultures, a different worldview about uh, medical practices, um, and just, again, just a general uh, different worldview than you know, uh, the Spanish-speaking society in Mexico. So um, it was really interesting to see what health disparities they experienced in their own country. And um, coming back from my trip, you know, finding opportunities here in the States to do um, work around healthcare and helping families navigate those systems. That sounds like an incredible experience. And to be able to take some of what you learned and, and kind of the passion that developed there into our community, I feel like we're really lucky. So maybe say a few words about how that experience did lead you to Oaxaca. Yeah, definitely. So working with indigenous communities in Oaxaca, Mexico was very inspiring because uh, I firsthand saw some of the inequities of health in a country that, again, is so diverse and rich in, in cultural experiences and people um, that our indigenous brothers and sisters in Mexico didn't have access to, um, you know, liaisons that were interpreters. I had to work with an interpreter that, again, was trusted in that community to mm -hmm. help them understand um, how to access prescriptions or medical appointments. Um, some communities just didn't have enough money to pay for certain basic uh, medical services. So after coming back from Mexico, I was looking for something as meaningful and fulfilling in Whatcom County. I decided to stay in Whatcom County um, to, again, expand kind of my skill set and um, expand from my, my um, you know, uh, experiences from, from Mexico. And I found, again, Wacom Alliance for Health Advancement in Oaxaca um, that, again, serves everyone, regardless of, you know, race, ethnicity, creed, belief, um, income. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has troubles with navigating the healthcare system because our U.S. healthcare system is so complicated. So I just felt like this natural, like, you know, um, you know pull to go into mm -hmm. Oaxaca and start as an administrative coordinator and uh, you know, kind of find different opportunities to, to work in a role where I help manage volunteers, managing our Shiva Medicare program that provides free and unbiased information in Medicare, to now managing our advanced care planning and just general operations. So mm -hmm. it's been a really uh, fun ride, it's still going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just hope that we can change healthcare for Whatcom County because I know change happens here at the local level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds yeah. both eye-opening with that original experience and then really fulfilling for you now. Do yeah. you consider healthcare a human right? Oh, most definitely, mm -hmm. most definitely. Uh, healthcare does not discriminate. Uh, you know, with my time at Waha, I've seen a lot of uh, various case scenarios of people trying to access health, and this should be, again, a basic human right for everyone to, again, access when whenever they have these life experiences of being newly diagnosed or having a baby or needing a checkup, um, this shouldn't be a struggle to get access to. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I definitely feel it's a human right, for sure. What yeah. are some barriers that people who come to you face when trying to access healthcare? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, we see all walks of life at our agency, and uh, people experience, you know, high out-of-pocket costs for their care, even though they have insurance. Our uninsured population, which isn't a lot in Whatcom County, uh, percentage-wise, they're, they're having trouble accessing quality care. There's only limited places that will allow them to access a provider based on you know, their income or um, their situation with their healthcare status. Uh, individuals who have insurance are confronted with a lot of healthcare jargon and medical bills that don't make sense. An operation that costs $300 for a recipient on one side of town for someone else who has better coverage, you know, the, the cost of care was over $1,000 for the exact same type of service. It's, it's a lot to deal with. And top, topping that with basic needs, accessing basic needs like shelter, food, um, you know, other family um, type of issues on top of healthcare, that's just, mm -hmm. it's just too much. So we see uh, healthcare is not just the medical side of things, getting your doctors and prescriptions and mental health, but it's also um, addressing other social determinants of health, like do you have basic living, uh, you know, uh, needs met, mm -hmm. housing, food, um, all those things to be met. So we see all those barriers come into play when someone's trying to access health and services. Is so. your area of expertise in programming there for Medicare in particular? Well, uh, programming for me is uh, definitely Medicare with our working with folks who are 65 or older with people with disabilities um, and also helping people navigate the health insurance system before they get on Medicare as well. So um, it's interesting to see that spectrum of health you know, and, and then they become eligible for new insurances as they age or mm -hmm. other life circumstances happen to them. So yeah, that's okay. kind of my role in that with client um, interactions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so on the next segment with the Social Security Administration discussion, mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about disability and Social Security insurance and whatnot. And I just heard you say that for with Medicare, people with disabilities can get it even if they're not 65 or over. Is that's that right? that's correct. Okay. Yes, um, people who get uh, Social Security disability income, also known as SSDI, recipients of that cash benefit can get Medicare when they have 24 months of receiving that check. Oh, um, so there's a quicker access point to getting Medicare federal health insurance by becoming disabled. Um, and in the meantime, between those two years, people will access insurance whether it's through their work, whether it's through the Washington Health Plan Finder, our state marketplace that became about uh, as a result of the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. um, or other types of coverage out there in the private market. But yes, uh, to answer your question, um, it takes 24 months for someone on disability, SSDI cover, um, insurance, mm -hmm. to get on Medicare. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So if somebody needs help in the community, whether they have insurance or not, mm -hmm. and they come to you, what's the process for them to actually sit down with somebody and, and you or another, or a volunteer, I've heard you use a lot of volunteers, can go through and let them know what's going on. How, how do they access that with you? Yeah, definitely. So first thing, um, our services are free, unbiased, and confidential. We're not gonna tell someone what to do. We will give them information so they can make the best informed decision based on their circumstances. And we also um, don't sell insurance. So when people come through our doors, we are not trying to sell them an insurance product. So. I want you know all Whatcom County res residents to know that. Mm -hmm. But when people need some assistance from us, whether it's via phone or in person during during an outreach event, we're always out in the community, in different fairs, um, you know, in faith-based institutions like you know churches or um, you know at the libraries to name some places. Um, when we're out in the community, we'll meet with, with folks one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and provide them the same level of service if they were to come into our office. Mm -hmm. um, we also help people in our physical office on 800 East Chestnut Street, where we can sit in a confidential space and talk through their situation. It's typically an hour appointment um, for couples or more family members. It's typically an hour and a half, but we, we go through everything that you could possibly think of in a health insurance kind of situation or problem solving with healthcare resources. We look at things like household and income, and um, if there's a condition that someone's experiencing, like cancer or um, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, to name just a couple of certain conditions, um, we look for different resources for what they're needing. 
And, um, you know, if we don't have the answer, we have these uh, referral systems set up so we can refer to one of our community partners to do the, to do the uh, additional handoff and, and follow up. Oh, so, wonderful. Yeah. That leads me to my next question, which mm -hmm. is what other organizations do you partner with? Yeah, yeah. So we are um, nothing without our community partners. Um, we currently uh, have active uh, agreements with uh, CMAR Community Health Center, Unity Care Community Health Center, Northwest Regional Council to serve um, individuals uh, with disabilities and, and our seniors. Um, we also have partnerships with Opportunity Council for accessing basic needs for mm -hmm. folks in the community. Um, and we do have um, some informal agreements with like Department of Social Health and Services, DSHS, things like that to help cross-train staff and members of our staff to learn about their services and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, those are just the big partners that we work with on a, a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always a potential partnership with um, other folks in the county for special projects or initiatives that we work on. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. That's great because, yep. as they say, it takes a village to be able to. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's to, mm -hmm. to kind of knit together a safety net for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how can people get a hold of you in terms of, you know, your phone number, or your website? Yes. Um, we can be uh, contacted by our local phone number, which is 360 788 6594. Our physical office is on 800 East Chestnut Street on the first floor at this time. We recently experienced a flood, so we're not in the basement anymore, but on the first floor, people can come in and we can make an appointment for them mm -hmm. um, so they can have some time to sit down with a volunteer or a staff member. Um, you can email us as well, uh, emailing um, info at whatcomealliance.org, and mm -hmm. we will respond as soon as we can uh, within typically three business days, but we have people checking the, the the main emails as, as frequently as possible. So, um, but those are our main points of contact. Um, we also provide classes for things like Medicare. Um, I personally uh, teach those classes at Whatcom Community College. Mm -hmm. So there's another entry point for people to interface with our agency through classes. Um, those Medicare 101 classes are completely free. All the materials that are provided in the class are actually on public websites like medicare.gov, but it's a matter of just consolidating all that info. We also provide advanced care planning workshops, which mm -hmm. is also another thing we're known for, mm -hmm. to, to talk about your wishes when you're unable to communicate for yourself. Mm -hmm. And those are provided in the community, and that's another entry point for people to access us. So Before this conversation, I had yeah. no idea that Waha did that much. Really? It was so oh, okay. visible yeah. in our community. Yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned the advanced care planning. Yeah. That is uh, super interesting because I know you mm -hmm. partner with other organizations around that. Mm -hmm. But talk about what that includes and then an upcoming event you have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, Waha, again, you know, our mission is to connect people to health care um, and also transform our local health care system to basically, you know, uh, improve the, the cost of care, the quality of care, and the patient experience. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks know us by, you know, the health insurance connection, whether you, from newborn to older age, everyone seems to know Waha for that type of role. But um, another program that we're, you know, um, not so, I guess, known for is the advanced care planning program. And the advanced care planning program is basically a group of volunteers, uh, currently we have 10, and they're dedicated to advancing the conversation about end of life choices and care options. Um, and that typically includes that advanced care planning process where you do this reflection about your personal like uh, goals and values and beliefs and how you would translate those into wishes when you're not able to communicate for yourself. Um, people can start that dialogue as young as 18 years old um, and you can go at any time, any point in your life to have those conversations with family about those wishes. Now, if you want to get those documented, mm -hmm. that could be put into a legal document called an advanced directive. And our volunteers help people through that facilitation process to have conversations with their family, talk to their designated healthcare agent, which is that person who's going to make those decisions for you on your behalf for your best interest and then getting that documented with the hospital or places of care that you go to. Mm -hmm. It is not like a one, two, three step process. It's very dependent on the person and their needs and how much reflection they're gonna need and um, 
you know, how much their support they're going to get from their loved ones and um, their medical community. Mm -hmm. But we can help facilitate that process, again, free of charge. We provide educational materials for the public about that. And we have an upcoming event on March 21st at uh, the Health Education Center, uh, 3333 Squalicum Parkway. Mm -hmm. It's going to um, uh, start at 6 p.m. till 8 p.m. It's going to be very fun. We're going to have music. We're going to have um, door prizes. There's five $1,500 scholarships for any student who comes through to our event. Mm -hmm. So you can be from Skagit Valley College, Whatcom um, Community College, Bellingham Technical College, Western uh, Washington University. Um, who am I also am I leaving out? Um, um, Northwest Indian College. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. our brothers and sisters at Northwest Indian College. If you're a student, just bring your ID and you be put into a raffle to win, um, you know, some some free cash for school. Oh so, um, you know, our, our intent with this uh, event in coordination with a consumer advocate, her name is Mickey Jackson. She's amazing. Um, with uh, Palliative Care Institute of Western Washington University and Peace mm -hmm. Health, our intention is to push that conversation to have that intergenerational dialogue with people, not only older folks over 50 years old, but including folks under 18 to 49 to start having those conversations with their families about really, mm -hmm. like, what do you want? You know, like we plan for a lot of things in our life, mm -hmm. parties, <laughs> you know, graduations, retirement. And this is another thing that's on that to-do list that is really important, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. we're not stressing out at, you know, um, you know, these emergency situations with our loved ones. And, you know, we all have a consensus as a, as a, as a family, you know, what that loved one would want or what you would want. Mm -hmm. So that event, again, is free. Um, we're trying to normalize that conversation about end of life, um, trying to, again, increase the amount of advanced directives in our community. Mm -hmm. um, but that event will be, again, another, you know, push for that conversation mm -hmm. in Whatcom County. Mm -hmm. So... That yeah. sounds wonderful. Yeah. I mean, so. door prizes to talk, you know, about death. Um, <laughs> right. It's great. And music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it seems like a very contemplative experience, uh, you yeah. know, focusing on your death and what you would like and, and mm -hmm. maybe even, you know, how you want to be perceived. It seems yeah. like a way of really understanding what you value in life. No, no. Yeah, which yes. is interesting. Um, yeah. I'm on the board of NAMI National Alliance on Mental Illness, mm -hmm. and we uh, promote something called a mental health directive. Mm -hmm. And so that's in case somebody goes into a mental health crisis and is unable to make decisions that mm -hmm. they can put forward different uh, wishes in terms of, I prefer mm -hmm. these medications, I won't take these medications. Right. Mm -hmm. I can... Um, be restrained, but I won't be put in a separate room, or mm -hmm. I never want a, a ECT. I mean, that type yes. of thing. So right. I wonder if that's included, or mm -hmm. if you could consider including a mental health directive. In right. So um, we can definitely include that in our advanced care planning kind of appointments and sessions with mm -hmm. families, oh, okay. for sure, um, in support of NAMI. We're, we're technically right across, um, our offices are right next right. to each other mm -hmm. on East Chestnut. Mm -hmm. So no doubt there there's, you know, some natural, you know, um, kind of flow with referring people to Waha and vice versa yeah. for services. But mental health, um, you know, advanced directive, again, specific to individuals who have a history of mental illness in their family or experiencing that as well is definitely recommended mm -hmm. ahead of time. Okay. You know, so um, we, we can definitely sit down with families. We actually encourage people to bring um, people who would be potential advocates for them, like, you know, their, their health care agent, which is um, considered a durable um, uh, power of attorney for healthcare, the the, the decision maker who does the um, you know uh, the, the decisions for that individual who's experiencing mental illness or whatever condition, and you know putting their interests forward mm -hmm. um, in those emergency or situations where they might be yeah. hospitalized. Okay. But um, that advanced directive is available through DSHS. There's other entities that make up those advanced directives, like attorneys in our community. Um, WAHA as an agency will assist anyone with any advanced directive um, as best as we, we're able to to help them fill out the forms and get them notarized if they need that to make it legal. Um, but uh, in general, we, we have our form of advanced directive. Um, there's a lot of advanced, advanced directives out there. Um, one size does not fit all, so we would definitely work with whatever anyone brings to us because uh, our intention is to get something documented if possible mm -hmm. or help people facilitate that conversation with their families. Yeah. 
That's yeah. amazing. And yeah. I'm so yeah. glad I had you on the show because you have a lot of good information mm -hmm. and Waha seems like it's for everybody. Um, yes. And that's important for all of us to know. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge. And yeah, um, yeah. and I, I plan on attending that workshop. So I'll see you there. Nice. Sounds okay. good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for joining us for this segment. And please stay tuned for a conversation about Social Security. Welcome back to Bellingham Voices. In this segment, I'll be talking with Scott McAllister. He is the district manager for the local Social Security Administration office. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks, Marie. It's great to have you here. And I had Australia Cosby on the last segment with WAHA, Walking mm -hmm. Alliance for Health Advancement. And I'm really excited to talk with you because it's important information that people need to know. And especially with federal programs, they're always complicated and multifaceted. So to have this opportunity to unpack language and processes for applying, et cetera, it'll be really great for our viewers. So I wanna launch right in to okay. the question that people probably ask you a lot, but it's about the solvency of the SSA because when I was in my 20s and 30s especially, and even now, people would always tell me it's not gonna exist when you need it when you're 65, 67. So is that true? Well, let's hope not because <laughs> it's part of my retirement as well, but <laughs> let's set the story straight. Uh, I don't think I can tell this without talking about baby boomers and something called trust funds. So mm. I'm gonna work that in. Mm -hmm. Just a, a brief history I think is important to understand is that Social Security was designed to be what they call a pay-as-you-go program. And that meant that the people that were receiving benefits, those benefits they received were being covered by the people that were currently working. Mm -hmm. And then when those people that were working retired, the people that came into the workforce behind them paid into Social Security to pay for those people that were on benefits. But we had a group called the Baby Boomers come along. And they were a massive workforce that came in um, to the country. And what happened was that they were earning so much money and paying into Social Security that we didn't need all that money to cover the people that were drawing benefits. That's where the trust funds come from. So when you hear that term trust funds, it's the excess money that was taken in and not needed to pay Social Security benefits. Mm -hmm. So once you understand that, then the other half of that is that once the baby boomers have passed through and are now right now in the middle of starting to draw benefits, we have a smaller workforce coming behind them. Because of that, the workforce coming behind is not contributing enough to Social Security to pay for all the people that are going to draw benefits. Mm -hmm. This is where the problem comes in. The trust funds, though, are a nice, um, uh, let's say, landing pad for this because what the government can now do is we can start to draw money out of those trust funds, which are well over a trillion dollars, to start to pay benefits mm -hmm. to cover these laps in funds mm -hmm. from what's coming in. The problem that we're realizing, though, is that based on the, the workers coming through the system, there will not be enough money to fund and pay all the people drawing benefits, and the trust funds are going to be exhausted attempting to do that. Mm. So this is what I always tell people. This is the bottom line, but it's not necessarily what will happen. But if, if worse came to worse, Social Security would only be able to pay about 77% uh, of benefits. So there'd be a 23% decrease in whatever you were getting. Mm. That's if nothing was done. Congress has, last I looked at, uh, maybe 15, 20 options, perhaps even more, that they could implement that could correct this shortfall and make sure that the program stays solvent. And I could dive into just some obvious ones, I suppose, you know, like um, raise the retirement age again, include more people that are paying into Social Security, um, look at how the benefits are calculated, but it even goes deeper than that. But the sooner they do this, the easier it is to make up that kind of a shortfall. So I would expect that we would see something take place soon to make sure that we don't have that drop in benefits and that we're getting our full 100% and not mm -hmm. just 77. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, and the key date is, um, is 2034. Mm. So if everything stays as it is and no changes are made, in 2034, that's when the trust funds would be depleted. I see. 
Right, just when I retire almost. Yes. But <laughs> um, how did the Social Security program start and then how has it evolved over time? Okay, well, it came about really kind of as a result of the Great Depression. There were so many people that went through that that were just so destitute. So the government decided that there had to be some sort of a public safety net to try to prop up people in a situation like this. So in 1934, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed and enacted the Social Security program. Mm. Um, and it's evolved quite a bit since then. So it started out just as a retirement program, a, a program to pay benefits to people who are retiring. Next, they added survivor benefits and spouse and child benefits so that a worker who was drawing could also get some funds for a child or a wife maybe that hadn't worked, or perhaps a wife could draw benefits if their spouse passed away. Mm. Then they brought in the disability program, mm. and they started a program where people who could no longer work um, could then draw a disability benefit. After that, um, and that was about 1954, I think. Mm. And then Medicare came along and became part of Social Security. And then Medicare was taken out, made its own agency. So now it works in conjunction with Social Security, but it's a separate entity. Mm. After that, there was a program that came about in the early 70s, about 1972, called Supplemental Security Income that was added to the program. This is referred to a lot as SSI. And so that's how people will hear it. Mm. And regular Social Security, they call it SSDI sometimes or just regular social security as I refer to it. Mm -hmm. So the SSI program came along and then in 1995, the agency became an independent agency. And then as a standalone um, agency with the United States government with their um, own commissioner. Mm -hmm. Some people may not even know how to apply for social security and you don't have much advertising. So how do we find out about that? Yeah. You know, and, and I always joke a little bit about that to people because we don't really have an advertising budget. You'll see occasional ads and a poster here and there in public, but this is really the format where we get to explain what's out there for people to come and apply for. Mm -hmm. So the question was if they wanted to apply for Social Security, how would they do it? Mm -hmm. it's, I see it as a twofold question. One is what are the... Um, schematics about just coming in and filing, such as when should you do it, if you're going to file at 62, or wait to your full retirement age. If you're going to file at 62, I would say come in probably two months before your 62nd birthday. Mm. If you read any of our brochures, they're going to say come in three months early. But we're not in that position where we need to have that much time here locally. So you could come in a couple of months early, even a month early, and we probably have no problem getting your Social Security retirement up and running. Mm -hmm. Now, the other issue is that when should I file for Social Security? And this comes down to a real personal issue with people because you're not, I'm not the same as you, you're not the same as me, our health may not be the same, our longevity may not be the same, our financial situation's mm -hmm. not the same. So people have to consider the fact that if they file it at earlier than their full retirement age, let's say at 62, they're going to have a reduction of about 30% over what they would get if they waited till their full retirement age, which mm. could be anywhere between 65 and 67, depending on the, the, their date of birth. Mm. So when I talk to people about that, it's a decision they have to make, I tell them. But I say, look at your health, look at your family history, look at your financial situation, and also consider that if you wait until your full retirement age to draw benefits, um, oftentimes the money you didn't take starting at age 62, you'd have to be in your early 80s before you made that money up by waiting. Mm. But still, the increase is significant for people that wait for their full retirement age. And if you wait until you're 70, which is as old as you can get, uh, or as old as you can wait to draw benefits and still have a benefit from waiting, mm. um, it can be a real significant increase. because. If you, were, if you knew your full retirement age benefit, which you can find out, and I'll explain that later, mm -hmm. you can actually earn an additional 8% a year for those years you wait between your full retirement age and age 70. Oh. That's how much your benefit increases. Makes quite a difference. Wow. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So every few years I get my booklet, and it's a few pages from Social Security, and it explains 
how much I would get if my income stays the same when I retire. It says if I were to die, what my spouse would get, and um, oh, if I was to apply for disability, what mm -hmm. I would get. So I look at the retirement amount, and I think there's no way I could live on it. But I do know people in our community who are elderly, and they do rely on that income as their sole source, and they supplement it with food stamps and Medicare, of course. Was Social Security ever intended to be the sole source of somebody's retirement income? Let me cover that two different ways. One, that piece of information you're talking about is called a Social Security statement. Mm. And that statement has now gone to an online source. Oh. And hopefully I'll get a chance to explain it to you, but anybody can get that statement anytime they want online. Mm -hmm. um, it's also possible to call the agency and ask for one, but they're not gonna send those out automatically anymore, except to people who are age 60 and nearing retirement. But the idea of Social Security being a sole source of retirement has never been the intention of the program from the very start. As a matter of fact, in all the years I've been with the agency and all the information that I've looked at, the agency has always said it needs to be part of a balanced um, program of saving and investments and a pension. And those types of things should be combined with your Social Security to make for a secure retirement. Unfortunately, if you were to look at the numbers now, about 62% of people rely on Social Security to be half of their income in retirement. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal that rely on it to be their only source of income in their retirement. And mm -hmm. I see those folks and it impresses me how they get by. Mm -hmm. Talk about the benefits that are available to people who are unable to work because of a disability. Well, what we've got, if, if you're disabled, we actually have two programs and one of them's hardly ever mentioned that I'm aware of or people I talk to people every day that aren't aware that it's there everyone knows we have our regular disability program through Social Security and I'll get back and talk a little more about that but the other program is called supplemental security income and I mentioned it earlier and that's a disability program and if you want to go into the difference between them what it is is that Social Security disability is based on your earnings and what you pay in. And if you look at your pay stub, you'll see on there, it's going to say FICA or it's going to say um, OASDI, um, Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance. Mm -hmm. And it's 6.2% that comes out of your check. Mm -hmm. Those funds are what you're paying in to earn that Social Security benefit. So if you become disabled, um, you have the right then to file for benefits based off your work history. And currently, the way it works is that you need to be disabled um, within at least five years of when you stop working. Or we like to say you have to have worked five out of the last 10 years when you come into file for disability. Mm -hmm. If you quit working a long, long time ago, you'll run out of your insured period of time that you can come into file for disability. Mm -hmm. Now, SSI is a program that does not come out of the Social Security Trust Funds. SSI is funded through the general taxes um, that people pay or the, or, the, or the general tax fund of the American government. Mm -hmm. And the SSI program has the same disability rules um, to be eligible to receive benefits from that program as far as being disabled. But the other requirements are it's a needs based program so there's a um, income and a resource criteria that must be met. And it pays a set rate of $750 this year to someone who could qualify for it and receive that full benefit. Mm -hmm. And I hate to get into things like the resource limits and income limits, and I, and I do that only for this reason, mm -hmm. and because it's the government. And we've got a core program, but off of that, I call it a tree with branches. So you've got that trunk, which is the core program, but off of that, there's all these things I call the if, ands, or buts. Mm -hmm. And so, Rather than have anybody screen themselves out, if it sounds like one of these programs or something I talk about might fit them, I say, come in and let us make that decision. Mm -hmm. It's fine to do that. Where's your office located? We're located at 710 Alabama Street. Mm -hmm. And the disability programs are for people who are unable to work due to a physical or mental disability. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll give you the exact definition if you like. Okay, please. The definition that the government uses is that you must have a disability or condition that would prevent you from working substantial gainful activity for at least 12 months or result in your death. Mm -hmm. And if you're found to fit into that, then you could be, qual be qualified for disability. Okay. Um, and I'll share this too, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of people have heard that you have to file three times to be eligible. And mm -hmm. if you talk to someone that filed three times, that'd be the case. Sometimes you go file one time and be eligible. But how this works is that almost all states in the country contract with the, or all state, yeah, all states in the country contract with Social Security to make our medical disability decisions for us. There's just a few states that don't. When the state makes a disability decision, they have to place somebody into a specific category that fits that disability. It's kind of like round pegs and round holes, square pegs and square holes. Mm -hmm. And if you don't quite fit it, they can't approve your claim. Mm -hmm. These are the people then that will file a reconsideration, which is more of a procedural review to make sure everything was done properly. And then if that's denied, they would file what's called a hearing. And then at the hearing, they get to meet with a judge. And the judge then can actually go outside of what we would call the disability listings the state's bound by to see if there aren't enough other things that this person suffers from based on work history, based on age, um, based on disability, based on education, where the judge can then define a disability exists where the state can't do that when you first file initially. Mm -hmm. And then the person, if they were approved, would receive benefits for the back pay from the date that they originally applied? That's correct. Okay. And, and there's a little flexibility in that depending on which program we're dealing with. But yes, basically, if they're found disabled, it could take them all the way back to that date. There's even situations, though, where somebody wasn't quite disabled when they filed, but they had a progressive condition. Mm -hmm. And during the course of filing these appeals and meeting with a judge, they finally crossed the threshold of disability, and they were found disabled at a point after they had filed. I see. That's helpful information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So two specific questions. What can a person do if they have lost their Social Security card? Well, uh, I love this question when I hear it because I say, I hope you didn't lose it in your wallet or your purse <laughs> because you should never carry your Social Security card mm -hmm. with your other identification. Uh -huh. If you do that, it sets you up for identity fraud mm -hmm. because then somebody has all the tools they need to become you. But if you lose your card, um, you can have it replaced. And you can do that um, by coming into a Social Security office. Um, you can do it by um, downloading a form online. It's called the SS5, filling it out and mailing it in with the proper identification. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I would mention about that is that you have to make sure you have the proper identification. And if you're a U.S. citizen, typically just a driver's license or a passport's enough to qualify as the ID that we need. If you're not a U.S. citizen, but maybe a legal resident of the country, you need to have that citizenship document or that document that says you have legal status also has to be presented to get a replacement card. But here's something people don't know, and that is that um, you can only get three replacement cards a year, and there's a lifetime limit of 10. Mm. So we ask people to take care of that card. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, that tree trunk before with all the mm -hmm. if, ands, or buts, if someone exceeds that, there's some... Um, fallback regulations rules we can fall on to meet a particular need if it's there. Okay. Well, I'm proud to say that I still have my original one from almost 46 years ago. You do too? Me too when I was 10 years oh, old. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay, wonderful. You kind of mentioned fraud, and I have a question about this because I read on your website preparing for the interview that mm -hmm. when a person dies, their number is released publicly. And so how somebody could take that and if I pass away, say, I'm Marie Marchand because they have my Social Security card and a company may not know that I've died. What, what that's talking about is that Social Security never reissues a number. Once a number is issued, it stays with that person for their life, and it stays even after death assigned to that person, mm -hmm. and the records will always be there. What it is, it's, it's the privacy rights and the privacy rules that are um, being looked at here. Once somebody dies, um, that information is public information as far as what their social security number was, and someone could actually file what we call a freedom of information request. They could file a FOIA and they could request to get information. And most commonly we see this people doing genealogy work. Oh. They want to find out what a relative's social security number was or maybe get some of the information about parents and family that might have been on the original application mm -hmm. for a social security card. So that information is there. It has to be requested, um, but, it, but it's available for things like genealogy. But it's always still will be your number even after you die. Mm -hmm and it'll never be reissued or be available for anybody um, to use. And if someone tried to use that number, it would instantly show up as a deceased individual. I see, I see, all right. 
what is the process somebody has to go through when they change their name, whether just for fun or whether they're getting married? And then does the new name have to appear on the social security card? You know, I love this question because I get to answer it, plus I get to uh, tell you about some of the problems we run into with that. Mm. Um, it, it can happen with a man or a woman, but typically ladies, um, since their name oftentimes will change with a marriage, they could have one, two, or three marriages and not change their name on their Social Security card. Mm -hmm. So if they do that and they get down the road one or two or three times, then becomes the issue. Because in order to change your name on a Social Security card, you have to have a legal document that says you can do so. That might be a marriage certificate, or it could be a court-ordered name change document, just as two examples. Mm -hmm. So if your name um, was on your Social Security card and you remarried, let's say, and you wanted to come in and change it to your married name, your marriage certificate would more than likely show your old name mm. and your new name. Oh, okay. So that would be the paper trail to connect the two, and mm -hmm. you'd have a piece of ID probably in your old name to match up. Mm -hmm. Then we could change your name. Mm -hmm. Other people go to court and get a legal document because they want to change their name for whatever personal reason. They can bring that legal name change document in, which typically will show the name they were and the name they're going to, plus ID in one of the names, and then we can change their name as well. Gotcha. That's good to know. But yes. <laughs> if Go you've ahead. got three marriages behind mm -hmm. you, you've got a lot of work to do because you mm -hmm. have to paper trail <laughs> all the way back to the last name on your card. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes a little bit of legwork and a few letters to the courts and maybe some personal visits to get all those documents. Ah, interesting. All right. Well, that person's had an interesting life anyway. Yeah. So three marriages. Um, so names, mm -hmm. I found this interesting and I thought our viewers would get a kick out of it, but um, you guys capture a lot of information and, and popular names is one of them. So in 2016, I want to read the first few. So the most popular boys' names, Noah, Liam, William, Mason, and then for girls, Emma, Olivia, Ava, and Sophia. And my name, Marie, ranked seventh in 1904, and now it's 583rd, so not popular. Marie is dropping? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's such a great name. Um, the name Ashley in 1964 was ranked 771st, mm -hmm. and then 30 years later ranked first. Wow. I, this stuff is just super interesting to me, and I was wondering... What other interesting facts, what other interesting information can mm -hmm. we mine from Social Security? Well, you, you found the draw to our website. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really the purpose of why they do this, is that oh. they want to put something out there to encourage some interest and get people on our website. And this is a great way to do it. And if you're going to have a baby, maybe you're thinking about a name, and a young couple might go there and look at all that and mm -hmm. get exposed to Social Security and all that they can do there on the website. Mm -hmm. We've got a fantastic website. It's been revamped, I don't know, four or five times in my career, maybe more, but it's really getting easy to use and to um, access all the different information that's there. It's just right at your fingertips when you go on. Mm -hmm. But we're also on LinkedIn, no, excuse me, on Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter. We might be on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> and that's there as well. But if you talk about interesting things with Social Security, uh, we also provide service in any language, too, and I think that's important oh. for people to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If um, you're deaf and you need a signer, or if you speak a foreign language, even some of the more obscure ones, um, we can usually accommodate you. We um, subscribe to a translation service, and, so, and we have a chart with numerous different languages on it. We ask somebody to point to one. We call up, we get a translator on the phone for that language, mm -hmm. and then we're able to communicate back and forth in our office. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. This is great information. So before we close, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to let people know about? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> it's one of our, um, I guess it's like our crown jewel right now, what we offer, and that's called the MySSA program. Mm. And what that is, is MySSA is your own personal portal into your Social Security records. And if you go onto our website, um, which... By the way, let me clarify what that is. It's www.socialsecurity, all one word, dot gov. Mm -hmm. Anything else might get you to a site that wants you to think they're them, but mm -hmm. they aren't, th aren't us. So, so it's www.socialsecurity.gov. Okay, that's super important. Otherwise, you could be giving your information to Im imposters. Right, and yeah. there's other people that have other sites, .gov, .com, .org, mm. .org, and they just want to... 
um, take care of your needs sometimes legitimately, but they want to charge you for it. Oh, I Social see. Security doesn't charge for any of our services. And, okay. And I actually have people come in and, and said they paid to get their Social Security number oh. replaced, and I mm -hmm. tell them that wasn't necessary. Just mm -hmm. visit with us. Okay. But when I was talking about the website and MySSA, on there, the MySSA program, you have to sign up for it, and we use what we call out-of-wallet questions meaning that it's only information you're going to know. We don't rely on ID or, or information about yourself that you could lose. So mm -hmm. it's like, what street did you live on when you were five? And what was your mm -hmm. first phone number? Or what was your first car loan? Or which bank do you currently have an account with? This kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And once you pass that, um, then you're allowed to, and verify who you are, you're allowed to set up this MySSA account. Now, on occasion, even people that work for Social Security have not been able to get past that security portion of it. Mm. So we have an out. Come to the Social Security office, bring your ID with you, mm -hmm. prove who you are, and then we'll mail you a code. And then at home, you can take that code, put it into the computer system when you're on the MySSA site and bypass the security questions because we already know who you are. Mm -hmm. But once you're in there, oh, you can actually get a replacement Medicare card. In some situations, a replacement Social Security card. You can file for Social Security benefits online, right in your home. My mm -hmm. wife did that just last year. It took us 15 minutes. You can get a benefit verification letter. You can even get a letter that says you're not receiving any benefits, because believe it or not, people want that for some different purposes out there. Mm -hmm. Also, you can get all the updated information on what's taking place with Social Security. The news um, articles are in there covering solvency. And, and anything you want to know about Social Security that's in the news, you can find it on our website, NYSSA. Wow. I recommend it for everybody to get an account. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much for joining me today. You've given us a lot of good information that we don't always see out there. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you've joined us. Well, I appreciate it very much. Always nice to get some information out to help people. Wonderful. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Bellingham Voices. We'll see you next time and take care. Mm -hmm.